In this passage, we read an obvious fact that few people recognize. That Jesus is the most divisive person to ever walk the face of the earth. Jesus himself said, suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth? I tell you nay, but rather division. As Jesus ministered, he stirred up a variety of responses. Love, hate, reception, rejection. But none were indifferent to him. And to those that considered themselves indifferent, Jesus said, He that is not with me is against me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Nothing has changed. Christ still divides. This morning we will consider the subject division because of Jesus. You see that plainly from the passage. It says that there was division because of Jesus. The first group that I'd like you to see from the passage this morning is those that heed the message. The truth is that you could probably break humanity in, down into lots of categories that do lots of different things with Jesus. But this morning, I'm just going to present to you three because I think of these three, most of every other breakdown is just a subset of those. And here we see the first category is those that actually heed the message. They hear it, they listen to it, and they believe it. You see the confession that these people make that Jesus speaks for God. Jesus stands up in the middle of this feast, in the last day of the feast, the great day of the feast. And he just proclaims a simple message that if anybody is thirsty, they can come to him and he will give them something to drink. He exhorts them. He encourages them to believe on him. He says, he that believeth on me, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And as the preaching of God's word goes forth from the mouth of the Son of God, the first reaction that we are given in this passage is that there are those that hear the message and then they heed it. They remark that Jesus speaks for God. There in verse 40, you'll notice it. It says, many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said, of a truth, this is the prophet. The word prophet means someone who speaks for God. You can think of a prophet as the mouthpiece of God. And Christ is not just any old prophet. He is the prophet. He is the definitive revelation of God to God's creation. That if you want to know who God is, you look to Jesus Christ. The people that heed this message, they recognize this. They understand that Jesus speaks for God. They make a simple statement, but it is a confession of their faith. It is an external showing of what is in their heart and what they believe about Jesus. And what they say is, of a truth, this is the prophet. Now this has deeper meaning than what we may consider on the surface because what they are referring to is a prophecy that Moses had given many, many years ago. In the book of Deuteronomy, Moses says in Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 15 that God is going to raise up a prophet like unto him. And he commands the children of Israel that when that prophet comes, the prophet who is like Moses, they are to listen to that prophet. And then God reiterates what Moses says in Deuteronomy 18, verse 18. He says, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee. And put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. That prophet who God promised to raise up is Jesus Christ. And as people hear the message that Jesus gives, where he says, if you believe on me, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water, speaking of the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
Some people hear this message and they heed this message and they immediately say, of a truth, this is the prophet. People connecting Jesus with the prophet who was to come is one of the recurring themes in the New Testament. If you write down Acts chapter 3 in verse number 22, when the apostles are preaching, we read these words. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall you hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And they are quoting that in reference to Jesus. Moses has clearly said that God will raise up a prophet that is like him, but even greater than him. This is Jesus showing openly that he is that prophet. The one who was foretold, and this first group, they hear this message, and they heed this message, and they say, Jesus is that prophet. This morning, I'd just like to point you to the fact that unless you believe that Jesus is the prophet, not a prophet, one among many, but the prophet, the definitive revelation of God himself to his creation, who is the image of the invisible God, unless you believe that, you'll die in your sins. But if you believe that Jesus is the prophet, you shall find life and life eternal. This first group that heeds the message, they hear it and then they heed it, they believe it, they accept it, they say, he is the prophet. You'll notice that within this group, there's a, another way that people express this. You know that when a, when a person first gets saved, they don't have all the Christian vocabulary that we do. Unless they were raised in church, when a person first comes to know Jesus as their Savior, they may not know exactly how to formulate with their mouth all that has taken place in their heart. But make no mistake about it, something will take place in their heart and something will come out of their mouth. This first group here says he is the prophet. And within that first group, you see another confession that people make. They make the confession that Jesus reconciles people to God. It's there in verse 41. It says, others said, this is the Christ. The word Christ means anointed. Christos is the Greek translation of the Hebrew word Messiah. Both words mean anointed. They mean God's chosen. And what was Christ chosen to do? To save his people from their sins. And within this group that heeds the message, one of them says, of a truth, this is the prophet. And another one says, this is the Christ. Christ has three offices in his work as Christ. And his Offices are prophet, priest, and king. And when people recognize Jesus as the Christ, what they are saying is, this is the prophet, this is the priest, and this is the king. As the prophet, he speaks for God. As the priest, he reconciles us to God. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ, Jesus. And as the king, he rules and reigns, not only over us and over our hearts, but also over all of his creation. And here we see the confession that they make, this is the Christ. When this group hears the message and they heed the message, they say, this is the prophet. This is the Christ. It is ultimately a demonstration that not only does Jesus speak for God, not only does Jesus reconcile us to God, but it is a demonstration chiefly with their mouth that Jesus has my trust. The truth of the matter is what divides all of the groups I'm going to speak about today is whether Jesus has your trust or he doesn't. Whether you have fully committed yourself to him in a penitent faith, believing that he can save you and that whatever he says is true or you haven't. Whether you have leaned upon him wholly with all of your heart, whether you have trusted fully in him or not. Because the truth is, a massive crowd hears the message, but only one-third of that crowd heeds the message. 
You see there in verses 40 and 41, what these people are saying is, Jesus has my trust. They make an authoritative statement. Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said, of a truth, this is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. Before we leave this point this morning, this first group that Jesus divides the crowd into is the group that heeds the message. My question is, are you in this group? I'm not asking, do you know the facts? Do you know the fact that Jesus was born of a virgin? Do you know the fact that Jesus lived a sinless life? Do you know the fact that Jesus died on the cross? Do you know the fact that Jesus rose from the dead? I'm not asking if you know the facts. I'm asking, do you have the faith? Faith is not mental assent to the facts. It is assent. It is also trust. And the question is not, do you know about Jesus? The question is, do you know Jesus? Have you found him to be the prophet? Have you found him to be the Christ? Or is he merely just a character from the storybook Bible that your parents would read to you and your Sunday school teacher would teach you about? Jesus divides the crowd here. And Jesus still divides the crowd today. And I know that it's unpopular in modern Christian circles to talk about division. But the truth is, Christ divides In fact, humanity comes to its conclusion with Christ dividing the sheep from the goats. And the definitive proof of whether you're a sheep or not is do you have the faith in Christ? You see, this first group of people, they hear the message and they actually heed it. When Jesus says, if you come to me, I'll give you water, they say, I believe that, and they come. Of a truth, this is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. The second group that Christ divides this crowd into in this story is the crowd that hinders the message. The truth is that God's word has gone out into all the world. But not all the world will hear the message and heed the message. In fact, much of the world will hear the message and then begin to hinder it. To try to prevent it from making progress. To try to sabotage it. To try to stop others from coming to Christ. You see that group here, the group that hinders the message, they have an argumentative spirit. There in verse number 41 it said, But some said, Shall Christ come out of Galilee? It's interesting that when a person gets born again, when their heart is truly transformed, when they truly trust Christ by faith, how the hinderers will come out of the woodwork. How those that don't actually accept the message and don't believe the message, but just seek to hinder the message, will suddenly spring up and try to cast doubt on Jesus and try to cast doubt on the transforming work that he's doing in your life. Those that hinder the message are are evident in this passage. It says, but some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? A transforming work has taken place in the hearts of those who have heeded the message. And immediately the hinderers pop right up and go, wait a minute. Will Christ come out of Galilee? They don't actually care about who Christ is. And the truth is, they are under-informed in their arguments. But they make them just as authoritatively as if they were fully informed. This is a crowd that is often cloaking their argumentative spirit in in spiritualism or being hyper-spiritual. They use church words. They even appeal to the authority of the Bible. But they're not looking to do anything other than cast doubt. You see it there that they have an under-informed argument in verse 42. They say, Hath not the Scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? 
They're right about what the Scripture says. But they're ignorant concerning Christ. See, when they see Christ, they see a man who came out of Galilee. But the truth is that Jesus Christ was born at Bethlehem and laid in a manger in the city of David. But these people are underinformed. They don't know all the facts. But that does not stop them from running their mouth and trying to hinder the work that Christ is doing. They don't desire to know all the facts. They don't care about all the facts. They just choose to be uninformed and ignorant and then question and cast doubt on those who are coming to believe. There in verse 42, you see that they don't know all the facts. Has not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? This is true. Micah chapter 5 in verse number 2 says, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel. Out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel. It is true that Christ is to come out of Bethlehem. But what they have missed is that the book of Matthew chapter number 1 and verse number 1 says, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. What they have missed is that Matthew chapter 2 and verse number 1, the Bible says, now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem. But the truth is, do you think that if they were presented with these facts, they would care? Probably not. I'm sure that you have dealt with people that try to hinder the message of Jesus and you've gave them all the arguments and they remained unconvinced and unpersuaded and then you find them making the same bad arguments that are underinformed to somebody else even though they've been corrected because the truth is they're not interested in the truth if they were they would come to Christ what they're interested in is hindering Jesus and remaining in rebellion to Jesus it is one of the saddest things that I experience as a pastor. To listen to somebody come against the truth of the Bible and then I open Scripture and show them Scripture after Scripture after Scripture about why what they believe is wrong. And then they leave and I see them continuing to propagate the same arguments even though they've been corrected. And the truth is there's a crowd that is under-informed and has an argumentative spirit and seeks to hinder what Jesus is doing. You could see it all around us in the world today. The Bible says that Jesus is going to be a king. Right, Isaiah 9, verse 7, of the increase of his government, there shall be no end. He shall sit on the throne of his father, David. But if you only have that part of the story, when you read Jesus suffering and Jesus dying, you go, Jesus can't be the Messiah. The Messiah is a king. But if you have all of the information that Jesus' kingdom is not of this world, because if it was, his servants would fight. Then you understand that Jesus is a king and has fulfilled that prophecy. But if you only have half that information, that's a very dangerous thing. The Old Testament prophesies Christ coming as a king. But it also prophesies him coming as a suffering servant who dies in the place of his people. And you read the stories in the gospel, what you see is people that were focused on one part of prophecy and disregarded another, and so they hindered the work of Christ. They have predictable actions. Those that hinder the work of Jesus, that hinder the message, they have predictable actions. You watch these people closely, here's how it always plays out. You can see it directly from this text. They ignore the totality of Scripture. Right? They focus in on what one verse of Scripture says and ignore everything else. Just yesterday, me and Michael talked to a couple of gentlemen. They were very nice. But both of them did the same thing. 
ignored scripture after scripture after scripture that I showed them that said, it's by faith, it's not of works, it's by grace, it's totally by grace. And they did not have anything to say other than this. They just go, well, doesn't James say faith without works is dead? And the truth is, it does. But faith without works is dead is not the only verse in the Bible. In fact, one verse before that, did you know that James 2 says, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness? But those who hinder the message, they focus in on one verse, they ignore the totality of Scripture. And through their ignoring of the rest of Scripture, they hinder the message. Baptists are a people that believe the Bible plus nothing for our doctrine. But we don't just believe one portion of the Bible, we believe all all of it. And the Bible doesn't contradict itself. And so you see these people here, they go, well, will Christ come out of Galilee? Doesn't Christ come out of Bethlehem? They're underinformed. They are correct, but they missed the part where Christ did come out of Bethlehem. They like to ignore the cohesiveness of Scripture. What I mean by this is that Scripture does not contradict if you come to a place in the Bible where you read something that you think contradicts with something else in the Bible, the problem is not with the Scripture. The problem is with your understanding. The issue is sometimes we have a pride problem and we go, well, this just contradicts. God doesn't contradict. The Bible says it was impossible for God to lie. Those that hinder the message, they ignore the totality of Scripture. They ignore the cohesiveness of Scripture. They ignore the parts of Scripture that don't fit their narrative. And then they cloak their ignorance in intellectual superiority. Oh, I'm smarter than you. You know what you're talking about. As the online presence of our church grows, I try really hard not to respond to the comments. I don't say anything. I just, let, I just let the preaching stand for itself. Every once in a while, someone says something that just makes me so mad because they are so arrogant, but they don't know what they're talking about. I just leave a Bible verse. There's a clip that went up on the YouTube channel of me quoting Hebrews chapter 7, which says, Such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. It's one of my favorite verses. I'm sure you've heard me quote it a lot. And this pious, hyper-spiritual person gets on there and goes, Jesus isn't harmless. I think the word you're looking for is peace. It's just like... I think you need to read Hebrews 7 and get off the internet. But that's what people do that hinder the message. And that's why you should spend less time on the internet and more time in the Bible so you don't end up like someone like that. That person probably walked away and were like, oh, I really told them. Meanwhile, their folly is manifest unto all. That's just a good example of how this plays itself out. Those who hinder the message, they often think, I'm smarter, I'm better, I know more. That's not the place that a Christian wants to be. We should be the humblest people in the world. So you see this crowd that hinders the message. There they ask the question, well, will Christ come out of Galilee? There in verse 41, others said, this is the Christ, but some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? They're right about what the Bible teaches, but they're wrong about who Christ is and what his history is. Isn't that sad? You'll notice the third group in this passage is those who hate the message. I think that some people that hinder the message, they hinder it out of their own pride. They hinder it out of their own arrogance. They, print, they hinder it out of their own perceived intellectual superiority. I don't think that they're actually malicious towards the message. I just think that a lot of them are underinformed. 
But there is a group out there that knows what Jesus teaches and hates it. There you see, right in verse 44, they want to kill Jesus. It says, and some of them would have taken him. But no man laid hands on him. Then came the officers of the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto him, Why have you not brought him? The officers answered, Never man spake like this man. There is a group of people that still exist today that wants nothing more than to destroy Jesus Christ. Our country is quickly filling up with them. You can tell them because they are the ones who hate the children of God. There are some people that are indifferent to Christianity, don't really care about it, right? They're just out jogging right now. They're just sleeping in right now. But there's some people right now reading books by Richard Dawkins and people like that that are just so wrapped up in hating Jesus, they have given their whole life to it. That's this group right here. You'll notice that this group that divides three ways, those who hear the message, those who, he, those who hear it and heed it, those who hear it and hinder it, and those who hear it and hate it are still around today. Just look closely, you'll see them. It is unbelievable how quickly those who hate the message are gaining ground right before our eyes. We see that the goal is ultimately to kill Jesus. You know, there is a large segment of our population, though they are still a minority, that would love nothing more than to ban Christianity altogether. I heard a comedian not long ago say something that was not only not funny, but downright blasphemous. She said, I would crucify Christ again. Everyone laughs. This is this group here. They hate the message. They send people to take Jesus, and then when they don't come back with Jesus, they get mad at those people. You see there in verse 45, Then came the officers to the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they said unto him, Why have you not brought him? The officers said, Never man spake like this man. Then answered the Pharisees, Are you also deceived? The goal of those who hate the message is always to destroy and to kill Jesus. And these people have predictable actions as well. The first thing that these people usually do is accuse others of being deceived. Who's ever heard people say, Christians are just sheep? Christianity is the opium of the masses. Christians are deceived. The Bible is nothing more than a book that is meant to deceive the world so it can control humanity. The Bible says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Jesus said, if the Son shall set you free, you'll be free indeed. But that doesn't stop those who hate the message from going, you Christians are deceived. And when those who hate the message don't get what they want from those who are hindering the message, right? These people, they don't believe the message, but they can't dispute the fact that there's something going on with Jesus. They say, never man spake like this man. And they immediately go, are you deceived? And if the accusations of being a simpleton and being deceived are not enough, what this group usually does is begin to appeal to their authority. I'm more educated than you are. Don't you see? It says master on the wall. Master's degree. What do you know? It's a logical fallacy to appeal to authority as a reason why you are right. But you'll notice it there in verse 48. It says, have any of the rulers of the Pharisees or have any of the rulers or the, of the Pharisees believed on him? They appeal to their authority. 
They say, have any of the people that are in charge or have any of the people that have studied believed in Jesus? You see it today, Christianity is stupid. No one believes that in colleges. Yeah, in colleges right now, they call men women and women men. You get your degree in ridiculousness. But it doesn't stop them from going, well, you haven't studied. Haven't studied your foolishness. That's true. And it happens in the religious world as well. You know, when liberal Christians who deny the Bible, I don't mean politically liberal, although there is often a correlation. When liberal Christians who deny the Bible begin to deny inerrancy, deny the sufficiency of Scripture, begin to deny the authority of Scripture, they often couch it in, well, we're just smarter than you people. You're those fundamentalist types. You're those dumb people that actually believe the Bible. We're educated. We know more than you. The liberals often say things like, you know what fundamentalist means? It means no fun, too much damn, and a little bit mental. That's how they perceive us. And that's what this group is doing here. The group that rejects Jesus, they go, do any of the rulers, do any of the Pharisees believe? Do the educated believe in this? In the late 60s and mid 70s, when the Southern Baptist Convention was going way liberal, way worse than it is now. W.A. Criswell was one of the biggest Southern Baptist preachers in America. He pastored the First Baptist Church of Dallas, Texas. He graduated with his PhD many years before from the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. And in his book, The Baptist Reformation, Jerry Sutton records that the liberal Southern Baptists would often point at W.A. Criswell and say, that man is a bold-faced liar. He knows that what he is teaching is wrong because nobody could have a PhD from Southern Seminary and still believe the Bible. And that same attitude is pervasive today. Nobody could be educated or intellectual and still believe in Jesus. It's not new. There's nothing new under the sun. You see the Pharisees here. They ask the question, do any of the rulers believe in him? Do any of the Pharisees believe in him? How many people that have master's degrees believe in him? That's an irrelevant question. From my study of the scripture, when Jesus chooses his disciples, he doesn't choose the Pharisees anyways. He just chooses fishermen, tax collectors. But if the accusing people of being deceived and simple doesn't work, if the attacking of the opposition, or if the appeal to authority doesn't work, they often just start attacking. They attack the opposition. You see that there in verse 49. It says, this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. It's a, just a direct attack. We're the righteous ones, you're the cursed ones. Something's wrong with you, everything's right about us. And if the attacking of the opposition doesn't work, they just start trying to intimidate the sympathizers. You know what the truth is? That amongst the people that are around the people that believe wrong, there's a group inside there that knows what's right. Nicodemus is a prime example of it. Right? Nicodemus, he knows the truth about Jesus. That's why he goes to Jesus at night. He knows, he says to Jesus, no man can do the things that he does unless he comes from God. And he's sympathetic to Jesus. But he's afraid of the as other people, so he won't confess him openly. But he does try to stick up for Jesus a little bit, and he is immediately intimidated. You see it there in verse 50. It says, Nicodemus saith unto them, He that came to Jesus by night, being one of them, doth our law judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth? 
They answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. The intimidation of, well, aren't you from Galilee too? What do you know anyways? They attack his education level, right? Search the scriptures, indicating that they're saying, hey, you don't know what the Bible teaches anyways. And what's sad is those who hate the message, they often bully people into going along with it. You could see that all over the place. But it also happens in churches where people know what's right, but then the opposition who hates the message of Jesus has an iron grip on the power and they bully everyone else into doing what's wrong. Nicodemus is immediately intimidated and then dismissed. This passage is clear that Jesus divides the crowd. The question is, where are you standing? Do you hear the message and heed it? Do you hear the message and hinder it? Or do you hear the message and hate it? As we read through a passage like this, we got to ask ourselves, which one of these characters are we? And you're not Jesus, so you got to be one of these other three. Do you hear Jesus and heed him? Do you hinder Jesus? Or do you just hate Jesus? You say, preacher, we're in church on Sunday morning. No one here hates Jesus. There's a lot of people that come to church because it's what they've always done because it's where their friends are. And they white-knuckle the pew the whole time just waiting for the preacher to stop preaching so they can talk to their friends. I hope that's none of you this morning. Jesus divides the world into three camps. Those who heed the message, those who hinder the message, and those who hate the message. Of those groups... Two end up in hell. In fact, the Bible says, He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Only those who heed the message by trusting in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior will be saved. Which group are you in this morning? Do you heed, do you hinder, or do you hate? Let's pray. Father, I pray this morning that you would help each of us to consider which of these groups we're in. Lord, if we're not in the group that hears the word and heeds it, Lord, I pray that you would bring conviction of sin. Draw these lost sinners to your son, Jesus, for salvation. Lord, we're thankful for the sacrifice Christ made on our behalf. Help us to trust him more every day. It is in his precious name that I do pray. Amen.